Hi everyone, fellow time travellers who I love so well. I really do. I feel so, so I get I get mail still, all the mail that, that keeps coming to you know to, to no address, you know, just to the coast guy or or, or or the or the guy off the telly and and so many, a gratifyingly large number, are sign off as as fellow time travellers, so that we're in touch, um, and I, I, you know it means a great deal to me. So yeah, thanks for, for for all the comments, you know everything that comes our way, these letters and everything else, the stuff that that comes in via email, that comes in via the website, and, and however it comes, you know we, you know we're, we're uh, Paul and I and the rest of us were. You know, we laugh at it and we, we we cry at it and we think about what you say, uh, and that's why when I say it matters such a lot to know that you're out there along for the ride, coming with me, travelling alongside uh, through space and time together. It, it's important. It's the most important thing. Listeners to and viewers of this podcast, you know, would know that I love history. Um, just because, well, history is everything that's ever happened. <laughs> How can you not be interested in everything that's ever happened? Um, this, this one, this, this episode is about uh, Homer, the blind bard of Chaos, and it's about the two great works that are associated with Homer, Iliad and the Iliad and the Odyssey, um, and all the fascinating debate about whether Homer was one person. He's that kind of ancient world Shakespeare. A lot of people say, no, no, they're, they're, these are the works of other people, multiple people, and, and that, that Homer's just a fiction. Maybe maybe is, maybe he isn't, but it's fascinating. And You know, I, I came at the Odyssey from a, by a roundabout route. I read James Joyce's Ulysses <laughs> before I read the Odyssey. And the, the, well, Joyce's work is, is a kind of a bonkers, uh, tribute or inspired by the, by the Odyssey and, and whatever. So and 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 you know I've always said or I've said for the longest time that it, if Homer didn't exist, you'd have to invent him because the Iliad and the Odyssey we can't be without them. Uh, they they show so much about the ancient world and and the Odyssey is in particular is so prescient, it's so relevant. It, it has so much to teach us about now. Okay, it's now time to strap into the time machine as we set off and hurtle towards the next stop in my love letter to the world. Recorder, microphone, action. There's something in them that we need to know and that we need to remember. Legendary heroes striding into the consciousness of the world. Stories of immortal beings and epic deeds. Bloody wars, sieges and fabled adventures on a long journey home. Spun from the imagination and from real history. An ancient oral tradition set down at last in text. A writer or writers whose words laid the foundations for a civilization some of the most influential work in Western literature that still informs and helps shape the world we live in today. Endeavouring to understand history in hopes of illuminating the future. I'm Neil Oliver and this is my love letter to the world. Good morning Neil. In the last episode, we travelled to Jerusalem as King Solomon's legendary temple was built. Which moment in the world's history are we witnessing this week? Hi Paul, yes, the great drive, skill and entrepreneurial get-up-and-go of the Phoenicians helped drive their empire forward. But as well as the practicalities of building, trading and making money, their scholars also developed a written script. And that script found its way to ancient Greece which leads us to our next moment in history, when Homer used it to write down what would become two of the foundation blocks of modern literature. It's the moment when the, the stories, or poems if you prefer, attributed to Homer were committed to writing. That's essentially 
the moment that we're talking about. But there's also, I suppose, a moment within that moment. But it's perhaps best if we get there in a little while, once we've talked a little bit about Homer, whoever Homer was, and if ever Homer actually existed. And when was he around? Well, there's no consensus. Well, you know the way in which uh, people look at the works of Shakespeare and and say, it's not all the work of one person? Yeah. Either they say there was no such person as Shakespeare or they say that the, the work attributed to Shakespeare is actually by someone else or maybe multiple people. You know that story. Yeah. And similar, similar stuff's been alleged about, say, in Hedwana, the first named poet uh. Uh, that, we, that we encountered at the very beginning of the love letter to the world. It seems to be the fate of, of, of those who have, in some respects, made the most unforgettable impacts on, on literature, there, there always seem to be question marks over those people, challenging whether or not those people existed or, or if they did, whether they wrote the work. I suppose either Homer was one person or he was a few people. <laughs> and there's, there isn't really any consensus. It, it would appear, it lets, let's imagine that there really was a Homer, one person, uh, and the works, of course, that we're talking about are the Iliad, uh, which is about the last year of the siege of Troy, when the Greeks besieged the city of Troy, which is in modern-day Turkey. And, you know, there, there's all sorts of violent daring do all the way through Iliad, characters like Hector and Achilles. The Odyssey is about the adventures of one of the protagonists of Troy, which is Odysseus, and the ten years that it takes him to get home after the siege of Troy to his kingdom in Ithaca. And he has all sorts of adventures along the way. So that's the Iliad and the Odyssey. If they were written by one person called Homer, then there's a general consensus that he lived somewhere around let's say 750 BC as a, as a date of birth, as a year of birth, and that, and that somewhere between 750 and maybe the, the end of the 8th century BC, the, those works were composed. But there is, there is a vagueness, they call him the blind bard of Chios, if he existed, that's when. Around he was, let's say, he was born around 750 years BC, uh, and a, you know, at some point in his in his maturity, he composed the Iliad and the Odyssey. But next to nothing is known about the individual. Uh. That's really the problem. And so there's always been this conjecture that even if he did exist, I think it's probably fair to imagine that he didn't originate the entirety of the stories that he, or the poems that he composed, that he was drawing upon works that were already ancient, that he was drawing upon stories that had already been recited and remembered for centuries, at least. So in that respect, at least, even if he's a real person, he's not creating the Iliad and the Odyssey out of nothing. He's pulling together into one place, stories and legends and myth and folklore that were already old. That's probably the fairest way to, to assess Homer's contribution, although clearly it's the language that he uses, it's the poetry and the prose that he creates that, that made those stories immortal. And that's why that's a moment. You know, we've done this before. It, it's always, it, it's so often been the case that there are, there's, there are oral traditions, that there are stories that people for the longest time just recite. They just commit to memory and they tell their children and the children learn them by heart and then they tell their children and so on and so on. But then you get these crystallising moments when they are committed to writing of one form or another. And it's like, at that point, they become, well, they become safe. 
they become fixed. To some extent, they stop changing. I mean, while the stories are oral, while people are just remembering them and reciting them, they're probably evolving. You know, they're probably quite fluid. I mean, each person that hears them probably you know, maybe, maybe changes a little bit or misremembers a bit or adds a bit in for their own entertainment. So it's a moment where they get set in stone, basically. You, 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 that sense of something becoming permanent and unchanging and fixed. These stories are probably evolving, growing, growing arms and legs, bits forgotten, new bits added. That would be that would be naturally in in the process of that oral tradition. At the moment when they get written down, they become fixed in a certain sense. They become unchanging and a bit inflexible in that moment. But there's no denying that the contribution made by whoever it was that, that, that wrote them down, the language is extraordinary. I mean, obviously, we're only, we can only work in translation. You know, they're, they're written down in Greek. But, and there are many translations. You know, different people have translated Iliad and, and, and Odyssey into English over the years. And there's a, a favourite translation of mine. There's a favourite passage of mine. Hector is the great hero of Troy and he's killed by Achilles. And Hector's wife is Andromache. And my, my favourite passage of mine is, Andromache led the lamentations of the women while she held in her hands the head of Hector, her greatest warrior. Husband, you are gone so young from life and leave me in your house a widow. Our son is still but a little fellow, child of ill-fated parents, you and I. How can he grow to manhood? Before that, this city shall be overthrown, for you are gone, you who kept watch over its wives and their little ones. You leave woe unutterable and mourning to your parents, Hector, but in my heart above all others bitter anguish shall abide. Your arms were not stretched out to me as you lay dying. You spoke to me no living word that I might have pondered as my tears fell night and day. That's good. (laughs) That's good writing that. And to me, I suppose, how could we really say that there has ever been civilization anywhere in the world at any point without words like those, without compositions like those, without poetry like that, even though that's coming through in translation? But language like that, th- elegant thought like that, summoned into being from somewhere, you know, even, even if it only existed for the length of a flash of lightning, just in that moment of its creation and its recitation or its composition, then you've got civilization across the whole expanse of billions of years of time. A moment made possible at some stage in the world that gives us language like that is civilized. That's civilization right there. I've been vaguely and really inexpressibly obsessed with the Iliad and the Odyssey for a, for a lot of years. I, I freely admit, I mean, even when I read them in, in translation, and I've had more than one copy of, of the book, each of the books over, over time, I find them very difficult. They're difficult to read in some ways. You know, there's great passages in them and there are great moments. But amongst other things, you're confronted with how, how different storytelling was in 750 BC. They're very repetitive. The same phrases are used again and again and again, almost like an incantation. Obviously, even after they've been written down, I think them being read out and so again recited to listeners, there are obviously techniques that seemed to work on an audience which involved repetition. And probably for a time when there was no writing and they were just being remembered verbatim, repetition gives you a kind it gives you stepping stones that you're working towards. Because they're said more than once, those bits become easy to remember because you keep on hearing them. And so there's a cadence and a rhythm around that repetition. So you can see different different techniques at play. You know, to compare them to reading a novel from the 21st century, it's a very, very different style, which is part of what makes them fascinating. And, I mean, for example, my obsession with Homer's language and Homer's stories also led me to James Joyce's Ulysses, 
U- Ulysses is the Latin form of Odysseus. So Odysseus is Greek as a name, and Ulysses is the rendering of that name into, into Latin. And James Joyce, the Irish writer, wrote Ulysses as a, what word to use, it's not a tribute to the Odyssey, but it's a reworking, or he took it as his inspiration. So while Odyssey is about is spread over 10 years, and it's the return of Odysseus to his kingdom in Ithaca, Ulysses is all happens across the course of a single day, which is the the 16th of June, 1904. So the, all, all the events happen to a cast of characters across that single day. And it, it, it's about the, the wanderings. If, if, if Odysseus wanders for 10 years to get back to Ithaca and has lots of adventures along the way, then James Joyce's character, Leopold Bloom, has all these wanderings across the course of that single day to get back to his home, and his home is just a house in Dublin. And while while Odysseus is coming home to Penelope, his faithful wife, in Ulysses, Leopold Bloom is gradually working his way back home to his wife, Molly, who is unfaithful. She's that very afternoon she's had she's had an encounter of a sexual sort with Leopold Bloom's compatriot um Blazes Boylan. Uh and so, so he's he's obviously. I, I mean, the, the the differences between the differences between Odyssey and Ulysses are are, are too numerous to, to even to contemplate for people who are familiar with both. But it's be, all I mean is that because because I was so preoccupied with Odyssey and Iliad, it, it drew me into into Ulysses, um, and I've become faintly obsessed with Ulysses as well. Although that's if 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 Odyssey is hard to read. Ulysses is next to impossible. <laughs> have you have you encountered Ulysses? Did you? Yeah, yeah. Same. I mean, it, it's. I mean, it's. But but for all that, it, in the same way that there are passages within it, there are pieces within Ulysses that I'm completely obsessed with. The power and the inventiveness of the language, and that there is a line, however slight and however dotted between the two, I find fascinating. And so I, I sort of I dip between I dip between them both, barely understanding either. <laughs> but they just they they just haunt my imagination. It just plays on my mind, and and so I, I am I am just fascinated as I'm fascinated by so many things with the way in which Homer's stories have lasted, and it's almost as though I suppose it's almost as though the world needs Homer. Whether he, whether he was one person or not, however those stories came to be written down, we seem to need them. In some ways, just as much now as anyone ever did. For the Greeks, Odyssey was almost like a Bible. I mean, it really, it really did work for them like a Bible. You know, they, they drew as much from it. As, as people have drawn from the Christian Bible, such a source of wisdom and, and such a, a source of important thought was it, was it regarded as being. You know, so it's on that scale. And so, you, you know, it would be incomplete. It, would be, it, would not, it wouldn't be right if we didn't consider where, you know, where those stories came from, the world that created them. So although they were written down somewhere in the, in the 8th century BC, they were certainly old. The themes and the characters were already well established from oral tradition. So we've got to go back into that ancient world in in search of what might have been the the inspiration for them. You know, we've talked about, in earlier moments in the story of the world, we've talked about the olive tree and the grapevine and how they gave life to ancient civilization, especially the olive tree, because it, it would grow... Uh, in terrain where other crops, wheat or barley, simply wouldn't. And the great richness in terms of the fruit and the oil that was, that was available from the, from the olive tree became the fuel of Greek civilization. It made all of that possible. But, but before you've got what we would consider to be the Greeks, you know, we touched on it in the story of, of the olive tree. There's the Minoans 
and their their palaces on on Crete and Knossos, and that's you know you're you're all the way back there at about two thousand years BC, and then after their time, the the Minoans are 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 somehow or other replaced after a few centuries on mainland Greece, uh, or what would be Greece in time, by the Mycenaean civilization, and that's named after uh, Mycenae, which is the principal city of that civilization. And the the Mycenaean civilization was founded by the Achaeans, who are once again in the same way that the Hyksos apparently arrived in Egypt as chariot riding invaders, and similarly the Aryans are supposed by some versions of the story the Aryans are supposed to have arrived in India as as chariot riding uh, invaders. So in some tellings the Achaeans come into the Greek peninsula and into that part of the world as chariot riding conquerors. But in any event, they replaced what had been the the Minoan civilization and they spread across Greece and into the islands. And sometime sometime in the the 13th century before the birth of Christ, some of those Achaeans destroyed Troy. So the, the conflict that is eventually set down in the Iliad almost certainly really happened. Troy was in the territory of what's Anatolia, which is the territory that we would know as Turkey. And its location uh, straddled where East meets West, effectively where Europe meets Asia. It's a a hefty stone's throw, but, but no more than that from Constantinople, Istanbul, which also sits where East meets West. So Troy is in that general neck of the woods. Different location, but it's, it's, it becomes important for the same reason, because its location meant that it also put it on top of trade routes. So there's people coming and going, East to West, West to East. So they're inevitably coming past Troy. And so the people of Troy became rich by taxing, claiming taxes from people moving in either direction. And by being powerful and rich, it was a target for acquisitive, you know, people on the make. And so the Achaeans go into it in the 13th century BC and they destroy it. They lay waste to it. In the aftermath of that, in the aftermath of the historical destruction of Troy, that early civilization in the territory of Greece starts to unravel for reasons that aren't properly understood uh, but the quality of civilization declines. There's a there's a kind of a, a descent into a darkness that's not properly understood. And while it's down, while civilization has has withered and fallen away, yet more people come in from the north. It, it's colonized. It would appear yet again by around a thousand BC, somewhere around there, in the aftermath of a plague that seems to have severely compromised the population there arrives a group of people called Dorians into the Greek peninsula. They bring a language, uh, which is Doric, which is a, well, it's regarded as a, a sort of a rustic tongue, a language and a dialect of the, of the common folk. And it was also the language, or the version of, of the language that was spoken in Sparta, Sparta of Leonidas in the 300, they spoke to one another in the Doric tongue. But it wasn't just the Dorians who came in at that point, around 1000 BC. There were uh, Aeolians and Ionians, uh, and the Ionians brought Ionic Greek, which is posh talk. (laughs) If if Doric is kind of the language of the, the fields, then Ionic becomes the language of the cities. And the, you know, and the people who spoke in the Ionic dialect looked down on people who spoke Doric. And so that's the that's this kind of a seedbed, I suppose, for the world that eventually gives birth to Homer. But all of that coming together, the coming together of of the Dorians, the Aeolians, and the Ionians, it doesn't give us the Greeks. It gives us 
a population who called themselves and understood themselves as Hellenes. H-E-L-L-E-N-E-S. The Hellenes were eventually called Greeks by the Romans. When the Romans eventually encounter those people, they call them Greeks. It's complicated. But the people themselves understood themselves to be Hellenes. And they were united by the language that we call Greek, although there were different there were different dialects within it. And so it was in Greek that Homer wrote down the Iliad and the Odyssey. Whether or not he created them entirely or whether or if he was drawing upon older traditions, he set them down. Now, we only just encountered the Phoenicians, the Phoenicians who were the great uh, sailors, the great mariners, the great builders who, who had been summoned to Jerusalem by Solomon to build him the first temple. Now, as well as trading, as well as taking their building skills around, as well as getting as far as Cornwall in pursuit of metals like tin, they also had a written alphabet, the Phoenicians. We don't know how they came up with it, but eventually, amongst others, it spread to the Hellenes. So the Hellenes used the Phoenician alphabet for their written language. So when Homer, whoever Homer was, first wrote down his poetry, he wrote it down using the Phoenician alphabet. It's like a big boiling pot of different cultures, civilizations, and influences, isn't it? Absolutely. It's it's the story over and over again. You know, there's this. It's almost like there's a, a cloud of dust over the ancient world, kicked up by so many marching feet, so many marching hooves, so many galloping hooves, and we've got to try and peer through that dust, that confusion, to try to try and discern, to glimpse you know, what might be going on. I'm very fond of the writing of Adam Nicholson, who is also deeply affected by Homer. Uh, He wrote a great book called The Mighty Dead, Why Homer Matters. It's reading him that, you know, I I really encountered this idea that, that Homer was more than one person. Adam Nicholson certainly subscribes to the idea that Homer is probably more than one writer. And to quote Adam Nicholson, even if he was just one person, he was drawing on a tradition. The poems were composed, uh, said Nicholson, by a man standing at the top of a human pyramid. He could not have stood there without the pyramid beneath him, and the pyramid consisted not only of the earlier poets in the tradition, but of their audiences too. But these are transformative moments. You know, this is a moment in the story of the world, this, when, when all of that tradition was pulled together for the first time and written down like in Hedjuana, the priestess of Ur, you know, writing down hymns which had probably been recited for a long time before her. And also like the keepers of the Rig Veda, you know, we talked about that development of the of the Hindu tradition, the Hindu culture. And for the longest time, the Rig Veda had just been recitations committed to memory. And then they too are eventually written. This is a recurring theme of these important thoughts eventually being crystallised and made permanent. And Adam Nicholson also has this idea that the stories written down by Homer come from an old world, that they are the folk memories of a much more primitive and warlike time when there was a sort of a a rough and ready warrior class who had originated somewhere out of Eurasia, the, the, the flat grasslands of Eurasia, and they, they came in on by chariot, they moved on horseback, And somewhere along the line, long before Homer, there was a meeting and a mixing of this warrior class with the polished urbanites of the cities of the eastern Mediterranean. And it was that coming together, it was that mixing of those two quite different civilizations that gave us the world of Socrates and Plato and Aristotle. It was that mixing that you described, that melting pot. You know, so long before Homer, people coming out of the coming out of Eurasia, rough, warrior, strong men, barely in control of warriors around them, somehow or other come into contact with people who are already settled in cities 
and there's some there's some mixing that happens, there's some coming together, consensual or not, and it has within it that fizzing energy that eventually gives birth to Greek civilization. And so Homer and the works that he committed to the page are a link, they're a, they're a bridge between the present and the past. And it's highly likely that the, the world that he was describing in those poems, in those stories about the warlords who do things like besiege a city and destroy a city, this idea of these warlords and their, and their fighting men, you know, loyal to them, that remembering that and being, and being reminded of that or being invited to imagine that past was probably thrilling for the readers. But at the same time as being thrilled by it, it, it probably made them glad that they didn't live like that anymore. They would enjoy reading about it and hearing about it, but it would, it would, it would remind them to be thankful that they had been born into their own world. And there is a difference, there's a difference in tone. If you look at both the Iliad and the Odyssey, there's a, there's a difference between them, and it's that difference really fundamentally that encourages people like Adam Nicholson and, and, and other scholars beside to suggest that there's the hand of more than one author, that, that more than one mind is involved. The Odyssey is probably, is probably the best of the two, it's probably the more exciting. Uh, it's probably the one that provides the most food for thought. You know, as I say, it's it's about Odysseus, king of Ithaca, uh, and after the, he's the he's the one that comes up with the idea for the wooden horse. That's Odysseus that comes up with that. You know, smuggling the Greek soldiers into the wooden horse, and then the wooden horse gets pulled inside the gates of Troy, and then you know, all hell breaks loose. Um, and it's all about his you know his his attempt eventually successful to get back to Penelope and his son Telemachus. But they have you know, he's got all sorts of all sorts of adventures along the way. He keeps on being waylaid. Him and his crew, they encounter the Lotus Eaters, they're taken prisoner by the Cyclops. So many of the stories that you've seen from the, the movies about the, the Greek legends, they're they're coming out of Odysseus's adventures. And one of the encounters is particularly important and it's when Odysseus encounters the sirens. And the sirens are these, these these feminine voices that are that are singing out, and they are captivating and almost and almost hypnotising Odysseus, and they're they're singing songs or they're telling stories of heroism, uh, they're, they're reminding him about his own past uh, and about his own you know heroic adventures, and his crew become extremely worried that that Odysseus is going to leave them. That he's going to be so attracted by the memories that the sirens are conjuring up for Odysseus that he'll leave them, and then where will they be? And so they tie him, they bind him to the mast of the ship in order to keep him focused on the here and now. And this is, I said at the top, that there's a moment within the moment. And so if, if the general moment is when those works were finally committed to the page, finally written down and made safe for all time, Perhaps the moment within the moment is that message in that encounter between Odysseus and the sirens about the necessity to keep focused on the present and not to be drawn back by nostalgia. Nostalgia is a word that's got, uh, it's a couple of Greek words that come together and it, it's kind of like homesickness, except the home that people feel sick for is the past. That's what nostalgia is. And as long ago as Homer and the Odyssey, it's this importance of not being lured back, not being seduced by the, by the notion of a gilded past, that you have to remain focused. So that's where Homer that's where Homer stands, between that enticing, intoxicating, nostalgic, gilded past and the, the necessities, the urgency of the present and, and from the present into the future. And it's because 
of that message amongst the many messages in the Odyssey. It's because of that, I suspect, that Homer, whoever Homer was, remains as alive and as relevant today as he ever was. They, they feel like very modern messages, don't they? They are. That's why. I mean, that. But that. That's why it's. You know, the stories of the Old Testament, or the poems and songs of the Rig Veda, or in Hedyoana's hymns, people care to remember them, and they're eventually made safe by being written down so that they can never be lost, because they contain truth. You know, of, of all the stories that are told, of all the of all the of all the nonsense that's conjured into being, all the dross, we 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 winnow that. We winnow that, you know, we winnow the chaff and we find this, you know, the, the, the important seeds within. Um, stories that last for thousands of years cannot and should not ever be discarded. It's a big mistake to look at, you know, the stories of the Old Testament and think, you know, archaic mumbo jumbo, set it aside. Stories don't last like that. People don't make the effort, first of all, to remember them and tell them to their children and then effectively to come up with writing. So that, so that they can be fossilised. People don't go to all of that effort, generation after generation, century after century, millennium after millennium. They don't go to that kind of effort for fun. They're doing it because they know that there's something unbelievably important enshrined within these stories. And maybe they're played around with, maybe they're added to and subtracted from, but somewhere within them is the kernel of truth. And so you approach a story like the Iliad or a story like the Odyssey with the utmost respect because they've been handed down to us out of the past because there's something in them that we need to know and that we need to remember. Growing up inside a huge walled garden, sheltered from the world beyond, fleeing and witnessing suffering and death, finding the Bodhi tree and awakening to the nature of reality, an ancient philosophy aiming to understand the universe and our existence within it, and the search for nirvana. Next time in my love letter to the world. To help support this podcast and to get access to new and exclusive history and comment vodcasts every week, sign up to my Neil Oliver Patreon site. It would be great to see you there. Check out the Instagram account too, called Neil Oliver Love Letter, and my YouTube channel, simply called The Neil Oliver Channel. And to help build this podcast, please tell your friends about it, get them listening, and write a review to convince the online crowd to join us. For further reading about these moments in time, you could try my book. It's called The Story of the World in 100 Moments, and it's published by Transworld. Neil Oliver's Love Letter to the World is produced by Paul Ratcliffe and Neil Oliver for Fat Belly Films. Music is composed by Milo McKinnon. Social media and YouTube producer is Oscar CFR. Additional research is by Evie, Lucian, Archie and Teddy. Finance is by Catherine and Trudy. Post-production is by Althorpe Studios and the graphics are by Paul Plowman. Thanks for listening. This has been an FBF Podcasts production. <laughs>